Good morning. I'm Lucas, and today I'm going to be talking about Postgres monitoring. Now, you know, I wish I could give this talk in Ottawa, but unfortunately, circumstances have changed. So today I'll give you a digital version of this talk. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what is missing in Postgres monitoring. So that means what is the functionality that should be there that would you know, make most people's lives easier, but is not there today. Some of that actually got added in Postgres 13. And so the talk is a mix of things that are there in 13 and things that are not yet there that, you know, um, maybe the community is already working on or, you know, that would be things that folks could work on um, that are hacking on Postgres itself. Now, a little bit about myself. So I'm Lucas. Um, I've worked with Postgres for many years now, um, including working within the context of running a cloud provider, um, specifically Azure Database for Postgres. I've also worked with Postgres in the context of scaling it out using the Citus extension for sharding. And then I've also worked with Postgres in the context of PG Analyze, a project for Postgres monitoring we've been running for more than eight years now. Obviously, um, with PG Analyze, we've seen many changes over the years. And so, you know, I hope to uh, keep uh, learning from this community about how to make Postgres better and also to give back and, you know, explain to folks how I personally see Postgres monitoring evolve over time. Now, to start, um, let's maybe take a step back and say, what are the problems with Postgres monitoring, right? So if we look at Postgres monitoring as a whole, what are the things that are challenging today? And so I would say there's three main things that I've seen. The monitoring data is often incomplete, right? So we see one aspect of the system, but we don't see the complete system. Also, we don't, you know, um, like not everybody has access to the monitoring data. Like if you're an application developer in a company, um, it is not that easy to get full access and to understand everything. And so, you know, a lot of this is also educational, not just, you know, providing new features. And last but not least, monitoring data often contains sensitive information. So this is, you know, a challenge where if you are in, you know, a healthcare setting, um, for example, you can't just give the Postgres logs to everybody on the team because there might be patient data in there. Now, for today, we are going to focus on what is incomplete about Postgres monitoring. So really, you know, this is about what are the things that are not there yet that should be added as, for example, Postgres statistic views. There's kind of five main categories that I would like to talk about today. First of all, um, we're going to talk about connections. So we're going to talk about connection handling. We're going to talk about connection security. Second, we'll talk about query planning. There's some good improvements there in Postgres 13. We'll highlight them. Then we'll look at the query execution. So we'll look at you know, active queries, historic queries, um, how parallel query gets surfaced in monitoring data, and how failures get handled in monitoring data. This is something that I've personally spent a lot of time on. Next, we'll look at the shared resources. So these are things like locks, the table and index access, um, or you know, overall system metrics like CPU, I/O, and memory. We'll also look about um, kind of the wall activity and the new functionality in Postgres 13 for surfacing that better. And last, we'll look at maintenance. So we'll look at the utility commands, we'll look at auto vacuum, we'll look at backups. And again, highlighting the things that are there today that you know might need some more adjustments or the features that are new in Postgres 13. Let's get started. So first of all, connection handling. So on the connection handling side, most of you are familiar with you know PGST activity, which is you know the core view, I would say, you know, if you look at the Postgres monitoring data in general, right, like static activity has so much valuable information in such a kind of <laughs> small table. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of important log events around kind of connections being established, um, disconnections, um, you know, certain kind of issues that happen around connections. So there's already a lot of data to look at. The thing that I've seen often missing around kind of, you know, connection handling and, you know, when you know, even before a query gets run, like what's happening in Postgres. It's really about the connection latency not being obvious to users and not being something that you can really track on a server side either, right? So this means, let's give an example, right? So like, let's say I have my application in a certain data center and I run my database in another maybe adjacent data center. If I, you know, look at this from an application performance perspective, whether the connection latency between the application and database is you know multiple milliseconds or the execution time of the query on a server is multiple milliseconds 
they look the same to the application, right? The application is waiting for the result. And so the challenge here is that if we don't explain this well, oftentimes, you know, things get attributed to Postgres being slow, when actually what's happening is that the network itself is the problem. And, you know, this gets worse, for example, if you don't run, like, let's say you run your laptop, um, you run a benchmark on your laptop, and you, you say Postgres is slow, but really what's slow is your laptop, you know, connecting over a local broadband connection into the cloud, for example. Now, what's interesting here is that there are some commands in Postgres that actually give you the kind of, you know, client-side latency. It's also all on the client side, right? So if I run psql, for example, I enable backslash timing, that would actually give me the information about, you know, how long does the query take end-to-end, -end, including the client latency or the connection latency. Um, however, that is, you know, not obvious, and it's just one number, not three numbers, right? It could be split up into the connection latency, the query planning, and the query execution. Um, and, you know, separately from that, libpq could also be better at this and actually surface this data more. All right. Um, let's talk about connection security for a moment. So on connection security, you obviously have, you know, views like pgstatssl, pgset, the GSS API for Kerberos, and a bunch of log events. I think the thing that's really missing for connection security is an aggregate view of who has tried to access my database. Right, so I can get that information if I parse the log files and really make sure that you know every log event gets categorized correctly. But there isn't a good summary view, and if I have a lot of activity, it's easy to miss individual events. Um, and so you know, having something simple as this user has logged in this many times, right, just the counter value going up, or this PGHBA line has matched, right. So like somebody logging into Trust um, authentication right now is pretty much invisible. And that's, you know, something that is a problem, like if I run a security sensitive system. All right. Next, we'll talk about query planning. So query planning obviously is very important, right? Um, every query gets planned at some point. Now, um, if you look at query planning, obviously explain is our, uh, I would say, main uh, Swiss Army knife there. Um, there are two good improvements here in Postgres 13. There is the fact that you now see the buffers that are being used for planning as part of explain output. And then the thing that I'm really excited about is that page set statements now shows the planning time. So that means that in stat statements, I can get an aggregate view. Let's look at the buffers first. So here we can see that you know, in this example, right, uh, this is an explain and analyze output. And we can see that the execution time of the query actually is only 0 0.4 milliseconds, right? So it's a really fast query. But the planning time was 45 milliseconds, so almost, you know, 100x um, of the the actual kind of, you know, um, execution time was, was spent in planning. Um, and that seems to have happened because the planner, uh, the planner was accessing the disk and that this guy was slow in this case. And so, you know, just to know which indexes could be used for the query or which tables would be, you know, involved in the query, that took so much time. And so, obviously, if you ran it again, it would be cached, right? So the planning time would be lower. But this is very helpful to understand where that slowness came from. And now, you know, on stat statements, you can get the aggregate planning time across all statements um, as an aggregate data. So that means that you can, you know, make an easy decision what queries to focus on, right? So if you had something, I've, I've seen this many times, and I was like, folks use uh, partial indexes for query optimization, which I think is actually really, you know, interesting. Like, it's a good, good approach. The problem, of course, with that is that the planning time goes up, right? Because the planner has to evaluate a lot more indexes to understand what, what kind of to utilize and how to execute the query. And so this would be something where if you had this in set segments as you do with 13, you actually will see the, the particular queries that kind of, you know, are slow um, come up and kind of get surfaced, right? So in this case here, for example, the top query, um, so that surface actually has, you know, five milliseconds planning time, but only 0 0.4 seconds execution time. So again, you know, really strong difference here, and you wouldn't have seen this before in pitch set segments. Now, I think one thing that's still missing with kind of, you know, the, all the information that we get on plans, we don't, so now we know how long it takes, which is really critical information that, you know, wasn't there before. 
we still don't know what kind of plans get generated. Right? So outside of looking at auto-explain and getting these samples that you can you know, collect with auto-explain, um, it's really difficult to understand what kind of query plans uh, get created in your database on a kind of summarized aggregate basis. And so there have been a couple of efforts here, um, mostly in extensions, um, to bring this capability to Postgres. So for example, pgstat plans um, was an effort many years ago at Second Important, where um, which eventually branched off into pgstat statements actually, um, which unfortunately is no longer maintained. Um, it's not safe for production, so I couldn't use it. Um, but you know this has existed for a while. Um, there's also PG store plans, which was you know an effort, I believe was it at NTT in Japan, um, where they, you know, essentially um, built an, an interesting extension here that, you know, could be used again for looking at the plan information on an aggregate basis. Um, however, you know, like it's fortunately not been maintained for the last couple of years, and so it's not something I would use in production. And then more recently, there's been efforts again to bring this to Postgres core, and as part of this, uh, somebody did write an extension called PGStat SQL plans, which tries to, again, you know, have an aggregate plan information, but, you know, like not something I would use in production today either. And so I think the summary here is, you know, those are not production ready and there isn't something that's mergeable into core. And, you know, to add to this, none of the cloud providers today offer any of these extensions, right? So if you run your database on database as a service provider, you couldn't use them anyway. All right. So, Kind of, you know, bigger section here, I would say, on query execution. So I've, I've spent a lot of time in query execution. Like, this is really where we focus on with PG Analyze, right? It's around, you know, query performance tuning. And so this is where, you know, I work closely uh, different aspects of Postgres. Now, if we look at the active queries, again, we come back to PG stat activity, right? So PG stat activity is something that, um, you know, is, is, is such a simple view, but gives us a lot of data, right? And so here on the active query, it tells us, you know, query is currently running, when it started running, um, when it is action that it, you know, is in, started running, um, and the weight events that are um, kind of active. The nice thing here is for the weight events is that we actually have a lot more now in Postgres 14. Um, so, you know, there's both new weight events that got added. It also, you know, um, Tom Lane kind of did a, a nice refactoring, I would say, on the different weight event names. And so this now is much easier to understand. Now, the problem, of course, is if you wrote a monitoring tool or you're familiar with a weight event name, that might have changed with Postgres 14. So it's helpful to go back and check and see that, you know, the name is actually still the same. One thing that I, I really miss here is being able to understand, you know, if something is not an debate event, but it's active, what is going on? So if you look at um, kind of, you know, uh, our list of debate events here, for example, it's empty, right, except for that one connection that, you know, is waiting for a client. And so this is, you know, whilst the PG restore is going on, so, you know, copying data in, um, and you can see that the there's four parallel uh, kind of workers going here. Um, they're all in the active state and they all have no weight events. So if I try to understand, you know, where is this workload bounded? Like what is, how could I improve on this, right? Like should I, you know, maybe reorder the table, you know, maybe it's the indexes that I've already created that I should have created after the restore and so on. And so in Postgres itself, there isn't really a way to do this today. Um, the way you can do this today, if you run in your own virtual machine, like I'm doing in the system, you can use the Linux perf command to get this data, right? So we can actually, with the Linux perf command, run, uh, for example, perf top or perf record, which is usually recommended, um, which gets you, you know, across your whole system, what are the functions that are executed both in the user space as well as the kernel space? And it gets you like a top-down view of everything. And so here we can see, right, obviously the Postgres copy is the busiest. Now, since we use uh, perf top G, which, you know, gives us the kind of call graphs we can actually see the details here, and we can see that you know one of the things that is very busy is the kind of input function handling, right? So when you when you're copying data into Postgres, the UID and the timestamp conversions are are one of the problems here. And you know we probably can't fix this, but it does help us understand you know maybe if we have a different table, would it go faster, right? Or like is this something that you know if I threw more like parallel threads onto it, maybe that makes sense, right? 
somewhat related to this is create progress monitoring, right? So this is, and I would say this goes a bit bigger, right? So you're not just trying to understand what's happening right now. You're also trying to understand, is this query going to run for five hours? Is it going to you know, finish in the next minute? Um, especially in a data warehousing case, or maybe you're know, running some big migration, um, it's often very difficult to you know, understand how long a query will keep running. Um, and so there are efforts on the way to, to do some of this you know, as an extensions. Um, Cybertech, for example, recently released PG Show Plans, which you know, is an extension that attempts to do this. I would say you know, th these are all fairly recent developments. Their Postgres Pro also has an extension there. Um, I would personally be careful if I run them on production. I'm sure folks do run them on production, but they are, I think, at this point, pretty invasive in how they work with Postgres. All right, um, let's talk about historic queries. And this comes you know, to my um, one of my favorite extensions, which is PGZ statements, right? Um, so PGZ statements, uh, you know, it, it, it's been with Postgres for a while, and I think it really did you know, change the scenery in terms of what is available um, and how, what kind of data you can get. And usually I would use this in conjunction with you know, the slow query notices, the statement notices, auto explain, right? So there's, I think, it, it, whilst it stands on its own, you really do need to combine it with the other um, kind of things. Now, the one thing that I, I think PGT statements should do better, and that I've often, you know, I think this is the disconnect between the people writing the database, like creating the source, or like, or like creating the code behind Postgres, and the folks actually using the database, right? Because I think um, most of the hackers don't they see themselves you know writing their own SQL and they think ORMs are not the best idea right like you should really be thinking about which SQL you're sending into the database and so I think the problem is that that's not the reality right like a reality is there's so many different applications out there and so many different developers and they use ORMs right they still use Postgres because it's a good database but they're not like they're not necessarily experts at writing good SQL and they're like oftentimes they don't you know they're not involved with this like they're one level up but they still want to understand, you know, what is slow about my database. Like, what do we need to optimize something? Did I forget an index, right? So these things are still important to them. And so one thing that I often see is ORMs like to write, you know, complex queries. And amongst them is, let's say you have a statement like select star from users, you know, like table users, and you say where ID in, right? And then you have like ID one, ID two, ID three. And so essentially it's, um, you know, enumerating along a long list. And so, you know, sometimes the query has like one ID, sometimes the query has like five IDs. And so that is something that set statements does not handle well because it generates one entry for each ID. And don't get me wrong, these IDs might behave differently, right? So the performance might be different the same way that a query plan could be different even if you send the same query in. However, the problem is the default page set statement settings give you 5,000 uh, entries. So that means if you have, you know, let's say 100 different variations or 500 different variations, right? Suddenly 10% of your page set statement space is taken up by this one query, just formatted differently or kind of, you know, with different variants. And so I think that's a bad experience, right? Because then you often get, you know, very like small but important statements that get, are no longer visible. And so this is something that Postgres could improve on, right? So Postgres could, for example, not handle in lists the way it does right now, like they could be grouped together. And you know, more detailed analysis could be kind of deferred for like plan level analysis. The other thing, you know, and kind of coming to plan level analysis is linking the stat statements output with you know other like views or logs is, is difficult because stat statements you know formats the query so it does like a normalized version, and then it also has the query ID which doesn't show up anywhere else in Postgres, and so making sense of that query ID. And let's say, you know, I find a slow query using stat statements, and then I want to actually go and, you know, look at the Postgres logs and find all the auto explains that reference the query ID. Today, I can't do that. Like, there is no way to do this. And so this is, I think, something that absolutely needs to be added in Postgres. There've been efforts to, you know, contribute patches. They've not been fruitful so far, but I, you know, I have hope um, that we'll, we'll land something there for Postgres 14. And then kind of related to this, right? So looking at what is the problem we're trying to solve. And I think oftentimes 
the way that the application developers look at these problems, right? They're not thinking about a slow like SQL statement or SQL query. They're thinking about which customer has you know bad experience or which web request is kind of slow. And so this comes down to that statements, you know, really only differentiating based on a query ID, but not based on any other criteria. And so, you know, if we look at this kind of, you know, an end-to-end -end flow perspective, let's say, you know, on one side, we kind of have our customer, right? And so we take that, you know, customer's web request, we send it to the database server, and then we execute that SQL statement, maybe, you know, generates an explain plan, um, and then essentially, you know, kind of all returns. Um, now, let's say I wanted to answer a question like, which customers were affected by a slow query, right? So I know there's been a slow query problem because an index was missing. Are this just my you know, trial customers being affected? Are these my highest paying production customers? That's an important question. Um, also, you know, things like I have a you know, request ID that I got from my APM, for example, and I want to find out, is there an explain plan for this? Today, that's not really straightforward to do. Now, the things that I've, you know, been involved with to try to improve this. So for the Citus uh, extension specifically, we've built an um, extension to a piece of stat statements called Citus stat statements, where we set for the multi-tenant use case, right? So where you're sharding your database by tenant ID or customer ID. We actually, you know, provide you per tenant statistics of how often each query has run. This will then help you understand also not just, you know, like how many how much activity does each customer have it also helps you make decision like should i move this really active customer to their own machine dedicated resources right versus keep them on a multi-tenant architecture second of all one thing that um, we've done at pg analyze um, or well you know many folks have done including us is that uh, we annotate our queries automatically Right, so for example, in Rails, there's an extension called Marginalia or Marginalia um, that the Basecamp team built actually for MySQL initially, but also useful for Postgres. Um, and so that you know changes the Rails Active Record ORM to always inject kind of a custom comment into each SQL query that runs that says, you know, this is the line of code where this query comes from. This is kind of you know the particular action or controller in Rails case, um, and then this is the request ID. Right, and so this means that I can now go and look for this request ID in my Postgres logs, and I would see all the auto-explain output like quickly summarized. And then this is kind of you know uh, something that I found kind of funny is like everybody seems to keep inventing this, right? So ever since Postgres has the wait events added, um, different providers and you know extension writers and everybody keeps inventing weight event aggregation, right? So there's PG weight sampling, which is like a open source extension you can use for like aggregating weight events. There is, you know, for example, what Azure does or what RDS does for kind of, you know, showing your aggregate weight event data as part of their monitoring products. PG Analyze, for example, also shows you this kind of as part of the dashboard and everybody does it slightly different. And so I think it would benefit everybody, you know, if there was one way to do this at least one way to get the data, right? Like it's not necessarily about the visualization, but the fact that, you know, everybody here is sampling with their own code, I'm sure it's error prone, right? I'm sure it does things wrong in some cases. And so having a community blessed version that does weight event aggregation, not just, you know, like showing the current weight events, but showing it historically somehow would be very helpful. All right, let's look at parallel query. So parallel query um, is of course important, right? So parallel query um, helps us understand are we, you know, kind of using parallel query or not? Um, I think, you know, Postgres 13 has a nice extension here where if you have a parallel query actively running, it will show you in pages that activity which queries relate to each other, right? So with the leader PID column now, you can clearly say this background worker, this parallel worker is actually because of this, you know, main process or main connection. Second of all, in Postgres 14, you have a good number of improvements around how explain shows parallel workers. So this you know, includes highlighting the JIT uh, data for, for each worker, highlighting the sort information for each worker, and there's also some fixes to the JSON output format. Now, I think the thing that's really missing with parallel query and that I've you know, found challenging myself when I tune a system is it's hard to see on an aggregate basis 
are my queries actually using parallel query, right? Like if I look at a system and I don't, you know, look at a particular explain plan, I just want to see on aggregate, am I using parallel query or not? It's really hard to tell. Similarly, it's really hard to say if I have configured the parallel workers correctly, right? So if I have a lot of parallel activity, what I will see happen is there are going to be parallel plans, but they're not going to be able to be executed because there's not enough workers. And that's something right now that's not very obvious. Last but not least, um, there's a nice improvement here in 13 around kind of when queries fail, which is an important thing to look at, right? Um, and so in Postgres 13, um, if you use the extended query protocol, right, before what would happen, for example, is let's say you have a division by zero error, right, the simplest example, and you use the extended query protocol to pass the kind of variables separately, which is good practice from a security perspective. And so what happens is that because you're passing it separately, right, the statement text itself has like dollar one or dollar two, it doesn't actually have, you know, the, the actual values. And so if you did a log min duration statement, it would give you the parameters. However, on an error case, it did not. Now, starting in Postgres 13, there's a new setting that you can enable that actually, you know, remembers these parameters in the case that there would be an error. And then it tells you this with the error, says, you know, extended query with parameters, so and so. Um, this is also useful if you have timeouts. Right? So if I have a timeout set to like 10 seconds after that, I kill the queries. Um, this helps me understand which customers were affected. Cool. Um, well, let's see. So I think there's a few things left here. Um, not too much to go. Um, so I think we'll look a little bit about, you know, what are the shared resources in Postgres? So, you know, there's, there's different kinds of things um, that we could look at here. Um, let's start with locks. So there is, you know, obviously PG locks as a view. Um, you know, it's been there for a while. It's, you know, pretty straightforward in a sense. Um, there's also many log events, right, that you could monitor, which oftentimes I find more useful because PG locks is kind of fleeting information. Like the moment you look at it, the moment it's gone. Um, I think the part that's really missing with PG locks is there's no aggregate view, right? So there's nothing that tells me in the past, locking has been an issue. And so let's imagine PGZ statements had a lock wait time column, right? So it would tell me this particular statement has been waiting on locks a lot, right? So that I can understand, should I optimize, you know, should I look for, you know, lock contention as a problem? Because it's not always that, you know, a lock takes longer than a second. It might just be that, you know, it's fast enough, but you know, in a statement that runs for 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, lock acquisition might still be the slow part. Looking at kind of table index access, right, there's a lot of information already out there. Um, and I think that's, you know, like you can make a lot of use about this. Um, I think the thing that I found missing as I look at, you know, optimizing indexes, for example, you know, which indexes to create is which statements are experiencing, you know, uh, going to sequential scans versus index scans. Um, and obviously, you know, you do auto explain for very particular cases, but similarly to the planning time counter, it would be very helpful if we had a index scan or sequential scan counter that just tells me roughly what to look for, what to look at. Now on CPU, IO and memory, there's a lot of uh, details that I can get just going into the system, right? So if I run top or HTOP, or I look at my cloud provider dashboard, I usually can get the good high level metrics. And there's some built-in sort of views in Postgres itself as well. I think the thing that's really missing on the memory side is connection usage, memory usage, right? So knowing how much memory each connection uses quickly so that I can understand as I'm tuning WorkMem in particular, right? The lower bound for WorkMem should be when I'm running into issues with temporary files, I should raise my WorkMem. But when should I stop raising my WorkMem? Like, should it be, you know, 100? Should it be 500? The only way to truly know would be once you run into out of memory issues. And so showing clearly how much memory each connection uses would work well to you know, help customers and users optimize this early. And then here's a nice thing that got added in Postgres 13 to help on the memory usage side, which is you know obviously shared buffers, you kind of know that takes memory, right? Um, in addition, there's other shared memory allocations that are now visible clearly in a new PG shared memory allocation view. It's just you know easy to say then this is why Postgres is using this much memory. 
And then this is again something that really, really, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the 13 is you can now not just get, you know, details on the read side of, you know, a workload, but you can get a lot of details on the write side of a workload, right? So when I have a write statement, oftentimes the actual work doesn't happen in the statement execution itself, right? Like the actual work happens really afterwards where, you know, the files get flushed to disk and the wall gets written and then handled later on, right? And so like it's replicated, for example. And so what got added in 13 is a lot of new information about how much wall does each statement generate? How much wall does auto vacuum generate? And so this then helps you optimize the kind of, you know, the, let's say for example, replication lag, right? You could reduce your replication lag by optimizing your wall generation. So here, you know, if you look at the new stat statements information, we have three new columns here. We have information about how many records, uh, wall records each statement generated. We have information about how many full page images got generated and then how many bytes got generated. And so here, for example, as I was looking at this on a test database, I was actually surprised to see that I had forgotten to make the temporary table unlocked, right? Because these tables do not need to be replicated or, you know, for crash recovery, they don't matter. And so really these should be unlocked so that they don't cause wall to be generated. And then it could already, you know, significantly improve the performance of the system. Similarly, um, when I look at auto vacuum, um, now I can see clearly how much wall auto vacuum processes generate. So if, let's say you have an idle system or you think you have an idle system and suddenly you see, you know, a spike in wall and you're like, why is there suddenly activity on the wall side? So this will now help you understand how much wall each auto vacuum generates. And then if you look at this in a very particular case, you now can also see for each explain that you run how much wall gets generated. So always remember, if you don't explain analyze on a modifying statement, make sure to do it in a transaction and then roll it back because it actually would update the data. But now I can, you know, say explain analyze wall. And then I see how in this case, the update statement, how many records and how many full page images and how many bytes this generates. All right, last, um, last kind of section here, which is about maintenance, right? Um, so, this already got much, much better in, you know, 11 and 12. Um, like step progress vacuum, I think really you know, started the trend here. Um, in 13, we now also have step progress analyze. Um, this will help you if you, you know, intentionally run with a higher default statistics target. And so you actually have analyzed uh, processes that take a lot of uh, CPU. Um, this will now, you know, kind of help you understand where are they at, um, how much progress are they making and so on. On auto vacuum, right, there is so much information already out there. Um, surprisingly, a lot of folks still have challenges with auto vacuum, which I think, you know, often speaks to the, like how to make it easier for, for users, not just, you know, add more information. Um, in that regard, I would say the one thing that could be helpful, right, to make more folks tune their auto vacuum more easily is having not just the log events and not just the PG step progress vacuum, but having like an aggregate view that's not just, you know, because right now you can only see the last vacuum, right? Like on a per table basis, but you can't really see how many vacuums happened or how much, you know, how long they take an average. Or if there's certain conditions like tuples not being removed because there's an open transaction. And so that is something I think that we could improve so that more um, folks can make, make use of it. And then um, this is, you know, it's a, I would say a side note, but the useful one, which is that you can now track uh, backup progress. Right, so in 13, I can actually now say, um, if I have PG base backup running, um, I can see the different phases, right? So I can see the base backup, for example, waiting for a checkpoint. Um, I can also see, you know, kind of as the files are being streamed, where the progress is at and how long it roughly will take to complete. And so that's really it, right? I think we, we talked about a lot of different things that are, you know, missing from Postgres and here's kind of the full list. Um, I encourage you to also, you know, look on the hackers mailing list. There are many things that I did not include. Um, I think these, you know, my personal assessment, these are the most important ones, um, but I'd be, you know, excited to talk more. Also, you know, help test the Postgres beta one um, came out last week. Um, I think there's a lot of good monitoring improvements here. We're of course looking to add support for those to PG Analyze as well. Um, but you know, many of those are standalone, so you can just, you know, query them and get benefit from them. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day and um, I'm curious to hear any questions the folks have. 
And we're back with Lucas for the Q&A session. Go ahead, Lucas. Thank you. Perfect. And sorry, folks, for the hiccup there um, for a moment. Um, I realized the talk had looped again. Um, but uh, you know, ha happy to to take questions. Um, I think right now there's just one question. So if you do have another question, please, you know, chime in on IRC. Otherwise, you know, happy to take them offline as well. Um, so just you know, scrolling back up here on history. Um, so I think we had a question earlier about. Let me see. There we go. Um, we had a question earlier about how would something like PGSTAT HBA file rules handle the PGHBA con file changing, right? So this was a question related to like one of my um, earlier kind of points around um, that, you know, there aren't any aggregate security events um, and essentially that there is, you know, no way to know historically like how many folks actually locked into the database. Um, and so there is actually a view today already that shows you the current HBA rules, but it doesn't actually give you the statistics, right? And so I think the point I was trying to make is that really, you know, at, at its simplest version, what we should have, I think, would be, you know, the HBA rule. And then we just have a counter that goes up that says, you know, this rule has matched this many times, right? Um, and this would really just help understand, you know, if I have a rule that's particularly security sensitive, like, you know, somebody logging in locally with trust, then you could, you know, quickly, like, verify that your system essentially didn't use that, right? So if I know that, you know, I had some kind of data access that I didn't expect, I could quickly go check that, you know, all the data access that, you know, happened since my last time I checked or last reset um, is actually, you know, fully authorized. Um, and so, so, so that's kind of how I was thinking about that. Um, I have not seen a patch yet about this, by the way. So I think, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, maybe I'll work on it for 14, maybe, you know, other folks can work on it for 14. So I think it, it, it would be probably straightforward. Um, now there might be some overhead, right? So there might be reasons why that hasn't happened yet, but I think it, it's it's an important thing from a security monitoring perspective. Um, I'll just check here if there's any other questions. Nope, looks good, perfect. Um, yeah, so I just want to, you know, uh, somebody on the IC also mentioned, you know, it looks like uh, Postgres 14 has many good changes to monitoring. So I, I, I concur with this, right? So just maybe to repeat again, when I initially started uh, like working on this talk, I thought that there, there's a lot of things that I'm that are missing that are not there yet. And in reality, I think 13 actually landed a, a lot of good improvements. So again, you know, please test beta one and report bugs because that's how we, you know, together stabilize um, Postgres. Cool. Thanks, everybody.